heter Maria Renström och har i 10-12 år arbetat på socialdepartementet i, i Sverige för er som inte har träffat på mig förut. Jag har främst arbetat med alkoholpolitik i relation till EU och även inom WHO där jag har träffat dag som har gått nu så jag. Men det som jag bara kort ska berätta innan jag släpper in vågens är att jag arbetar sedan första maj på den nationella narkotikapolitiska samordnarens kansli i Sverige. Riksdagen har utsett en nationell drugsarm på engelska översättningen som kommer att finnas fram till 2005 när också den handlingsplan som riksdag och regering har beslutat om i Sverige. Den gäller under den perioden. På det här kansliet kommer vi att bli cirka 10 personer. Vi, kommer att ha vi har tre huvudområden. Ett huvudområde är förebyggande och attitydpåverkande insatser och samordning. Och där kommer jag att vara huvudansvarig. Sen har vi ett för vård och behandling. Och där finns det ännu inte någon, men det kommer att komma efter sommaren. Och sen har vi då de delar som handlar om kontroll, lagstiftning. Och där är det Walter Kege, heter den personen som då kommer från Rikspolisstyrelsen och har jobbat på narkotikarotten. Så att vi har alla rekryterats utifrån att vi har funnits på de här områdena i många år. Och Sen har vi lite informatörer och journalister för vi ska arbeta mycket med opinionsbildning och med att eh, vad ska man säga, initiera och föra debatt om de här frågorna. Det var kort om mig. Eh, nu börjar då eftermiddagspasset som har tre delar. Varje del är då på ungefär en timme och där presenteras under varje två projekt som har inriktats och förebyggande projekt från de olika nordiska länderna. Eh, och med då varje avsnitt så här avslutas med en möjlighet för frågor och diskussion. Och jag, det, eftersom det är kort om tid och många talare är det bra om vi kan försöka ta frågor och diskussion efter presentationerna om det är okej okay för det. Mm. Eh, sen eh, Ja, alltså sen slutar vi klockan sex har jag sett i programmet och middagen är kvart i åtta. Så att det är lite tid där också om vi skulle behöva dra över. Ja, eh, då ska jag lämna över ordet till Mågens Johansen som då jobbar på The National Institute of Forensic Chemistry i Danmark. Och du ska presentera då ett... Ja, det kan man säga är också ett projekt, men där man också skapat då en databas med uppgifter om extensivmarknaden i Danmark. Ja, jag lämnar ordet till dig. Tack. Och jag har lovat att på engelska för att lätt språkvarierna ja, för för den till svenska och finska. Um, jag är utan, sorry, I was trained as an organic chemist, so I'm not an expert with the biological effects. So you're welcome to ask me, but I might not be able to answer these kind of questions. Um, I took myself the liberty to explain a little about illegal labs and then said that organic chemistry as I think that might have some value for you to learn about and know about. And the structure of MDMA or the classic efficacy is shown here and the usual way you describe that in organic literature is shown here below. Um, and I don't know if it's obvious, it's obvious for you what this means, but even though this is a simple two-dimensional structure shown here, I mean, behind that there is an organic uh, meaning or biological meaning that it is a three-dimensional molecule we have. And um, for each corner in this structure there is a carbon atom. And the essence of organic chemistry is linking these carbon atoms together and thereby building, I mean, whatever molecule you're aiming at. Okay, so the first question I would ask was why amphetamine based design drugs? And I think for an organic chemistry at least there could be an obvious reason for that. And if you look at the slide, there is the structure in the middle and 
the amphetamine, and then there are four other typical narcotics. And you all probably know that heroin, cocaine, THC, as well, they all derive from natural sources. Amphetamine, being very, very simple, is an obvious target for, for synthesis. I mean, for making it in the lab. It would be really difficult to make heroin in the lab. I mean, it's been done, it takes maybe 15, 20 steps, and the yield would be 2 or 3%. But I think anyone could make amphetamine if you'd like to do that. So knowing that, I mean, it's very easy for people not only to make amphetamine, but also to make MDMA or any of the other derivatives which we have seen. And this list is maybe a little exhaustive, but it's what we've seen in Denmark within the last years. And that's what we call the cyanodrugs, because what they do is they take MDMA, or another compound which is controlled, and they change a little on the structure, and then they reach to a compound which has maybe the same psychotropic effects, but it's not controlled. And you can see, of course, I mean, the amphetamine up here, MDMA. Then you see a small change, which is, is evident here, that you can go from the meth group up here to the ethyl group. And by doing that, they they get out of, I mean, the hands of the law. I mean, this compound was perfectly legal until February 2001. At the time, it was in, when it was, I mean, it was put under the list of, of controlled compounds. Other amphetamine derivatives are shown down here. I mean, you can see another derivative, but instead of a methyl here, they put an ethyl here. And also where the change on the core out here, <laughs> the on the aromatic ring, for instance, in the dot here, or in the PMA or PMMA, and these two compounds are claimed to be the compounds which caused three deaths in Denmark in the year 2000. Other compounds, which is fairly novel, that was the 2CB, which had some incidents a few years ago, 2CI, which was in a single case recently, and 2CT2, which is also of the same family, or at least these are the same family as the amphetamine. But these down here lacks the methyl group here, and therefore should more probably be called phenethylamines. But again, I mean, I'm not any biological expert, so I don't know if they, they might go on the same receptor. Okay. If we continue a little bit the organic chemistry before going to the base, uh, this is from a legal lab in Greece, which was uh, raided one and a half year ago. Mm -hmm. And the reason why I show you this picture is to make two things clear. First of all, the simplicity of making amphetamine. Uh, you can see, maybe it doesn't make sense for you when you just see the structures here, but this is acetone, and all you know acetone. Everyone knows chlorine, right? So now we have one of the compounds. Benzene, I think it's known for most of you too. It's a non-controlled compound, at least within the EU. And aluminum uh, chloride here is used by METAS, which is a chain of um, small shops in Denmark selling uh, house chemicals and deodorants and this stuff. And that was made as an, an antiperspirant uh, compound. So, I mean, it's really simple compounds which you can buy wherever you want. And by using such simple compound, and actually the second thing they did in Greece was that it was in a part of a pharmaceutical company no one would know that this company actually produced uh, illegal amphetamine. The last slide with organic chemistry is from an illegal lab in Denmark, and uh, there's some interesting points in it. First of all, the recipe over here is fun because, I mean, maybe some of it is Norwegian because I can't read it, or maybe they're just very poor at spelling. <laughs> Sorry, I mean... <laughs> I mean, if you read it, it's visual, it's evident that it's very, very simple to make amphetamine, right? It's, it's more easy, actually, than cook uh, whatever recipe you want to cook in the kitchen, right? You just take the compounds, if you can get them uncontrolled, you mix them, and then you just follow this, which is... I mean, if I would have written it, I would have written it entirely different. And therefore, for me, it's obvious that this was not written by a chemist. This was done by somebody who has no, I mean, no knowledge at all within organic chemistry. Possibly, or usually, these recipes are just passed among from one to another, and then they teach each other how to make these things. But again, it's, it's, it's not custom in Denmark we have illegal labs. I mean, usually, I mean, most of the compounds uh, come from, stem from the Netherlands, Belgium, and Poland. 
so the lab in Greece was was not usually our usual lab. Okay, but now I'll turn to the database, and that's an unusual thing too because it's a collaboration between the National Board of Health, uh, Police Policy, the National Police, and then the Forensic Institute in Denmark. And there are three forensic institutes. And uh, the idea of making a database was, of course, to collect all the data and all the OSCOs use it. And the idea of making it a web database was that we could actually enter data into the base on different locations in Denmark. So we didn't have to be at the same spot to, to use the base. And moreover, we could share the information with other people which would be interested in, in the base that we had. So it is shown here what the objective of the National Board <coughs> of Health could be. And I mean, they have, they have an urge and a wish, uh, also an obligation to inform the public on obtainable ecstasy tablets and new drugs, drugs in high concentration, etc. And also they, as far as I know, they notify the EMCG. EMCDDA and your warning system. And the national police, on their hands, would like to have an overview of the market and a quick access to all the analytical results which we get. So we have a formal agreement which looks similar to this, not exactly, but this is the headlines, that we promise that within 11 days after the seizure has been done and delivered at one of the departments, uh, this information should be available. And that would be the physical description of the tablet, so that would be the weight and as you can read the diamonds and things as well as imprint. And the analysis work, which would be the chemical description. I mean, if there would be any restricted drugs in it, what restricted drugs, the purity, the amount, etc. etc. And what we do then if, if we get something which should be potentially hazard, I mean they all, but I mean some novel trends we will inform the uh, the national board as, as soon as we as we know the result. So if you log in onto the database, then this would be the first page you see. And uh, if you do this, then you can see there is a menu on the left, which says a little bit about what we can do here. I mean, that's standard things which you should be able to do in the database. The third thing we could do is to make, let's say we have a new project, we want to enter the data, we push the button, and we get this form. And here we then I mean, the forensic institutes enter whatever they get out of the results. The journal numbers from the police and the lab and project number in this database. We put in the, the logo, which Europol, uh, from time to time, updates the base. Um, and each logo has a number and a name. And as far as it's possible, we use these names and these numbers in the database. Um, they do not have analysis of the tablets in, in the Europol catalog, so what we do also is, based on the content and the color, etc., on, on each tablet, give them a, a subgroup number here, because we get a lot of Mitsubishi tablets, but they're different in size and colors and even in, in what they contain. Uh, after the project has been entered, uh, it will be reviewed in Aarhus, which is the coordinating lab, and uh, if everything is okay and there's no problems with the data, uh, they will be finally cleared by uh, one of the chemists or one of the lab technicians, and the data will be sent to the National Police, and they will enter uh, the database. If you push the button for Bibliotheque, uh, you'll then get an overview of all the different tablets we have, or that have been seized in Denmark. And if you then choose to say, I'm, you can see the number here again. I mean, it's not from number one, etc. It's taken, I mean, from the Europol codes. By right? <coughs> one number, and then you can see the, the average content and size of that particular type of tablet. For instance, the Smiley tablet. And I mean, this information is also available for uh, the National Board of Health if they would like to see this. Then you can see, I mean, the Smiley and the number in the Europol, you can see it's red. Nistot is, uh, this is Nistot, whatever it is in English. Uh, it has uh, a Macau, which would be, uh, I, think I'm just, I don't remember that in English, uh, and, and the content down here uh, of diameter, the tablet, millimeter, and weight, and what's in it, and how much, how many percent. So, I mean, a typical tablet would maybe be 40% of its weight would be in DNA or the active. 
could also make a search within DataSpace if we would say how many different Mitsubishi tablets do we have? Or we can make an overview to see, I mean, all the seizures which have been done in the database. And this is similar to the bibliotheque, but this time it's, it's each particular seizure which would have its own answer here. If you push one of them, we can get again. Again, a similar entry as if you push down the bibliotheque, but this time you also have the number of tablets which was seized. And I mean, many of the seizures are small. I mean, it's, it's 5, 10, 20 tablets that you should carry. Uh, but some of them, of course, are larger, are more thousands, depending on, on where the, the seizure was done. <coughs> and again, I mean, a full description of the, the tablet, including the, the police journal number. So what is more interesting also maybe from your point of view is what kind of data can we extract from the database? I mean, that gives a, a current view of the situation in Denmark. And uh, this is, for instance, from 2001. The base was started in the year two, 2001. So actually, I mean, the only accurate bit picture we have of, of, of all over Denmark would be from 2001 onward. But there we see a tendency which I think is, is, is common all over Europe that the amount of MPMA tablets, I mean tablets containing classical ecstasy, is, is high. There are some incidents of, of the other uh, of the other active ingredients. In particular, we pay attention if there's any PMA or PMA in them, because this was what we, as far as we know, were quite toxic and caused the death. In this. Goes further behind the, before the database was actually created. So this is only seizures which was delivered to to us from from the police and office. But there you can see some other valuable information. And even though that not much happened, perhaps in the year 2001, you can see uh, there is some tendency that from time to time new compounds emerge on the market and then they, they, they disappear again. For instance, MDE was here, and that was at the time it was legal in in the Netherlands MDE. And then they made uh, MDE, I mean, it was banned also, put on the, on the list. And after that, I mean, they stopped producing MDE in the Netherlands. Uh, we have 2CB here in 1998, uh, MPDB, and uh, some amphetamine in the tablets down there. Another thing which could be interesting is how much do they actually contain these tablets? And it's very varying. Uh, as you can see here, it's coming from with MDMA from one up to now 120 milligrams, which is really a lot for a tablet. And we're not currently double-checking that result. Uh, but you see here the content, I mean, MDMA is the one which is uh, the highest content. And unfortunately enough, the PMA content was actually lower after the death in Europe. Uh, there are fairly many deaths of PMA, and then after that, the producer actually lowered the content of PMA in the tablets. Here's maybe a more correct view of content because I mean, here you can see that the, the average content is around 50, 60, 70 milligrams of MDMA per tablet. But again, I mean, some are with very low amount and some higher. Another thing which is interesting is, is how long time are these tablets on the market? And uh, you see they, they usually have only a certain amount of time where they're there, maybe seven, eight, nine months, and then they disappear again. And the reason for that could be that, I mean, maybe a big portion was delivered to Denmark and after this period it sold out. Or it could be a you know, pure physical thing that the, the punches they use in the tap machine, they only have a certain duration or lifetime. And when the punch is finished, the tap machine, I mean, need new punches. And usually they go and order new punches with a new logo because, I mean, the, it's, it's habit or custom for them. So the next time they get a new punch, they get a new logo and we have new tablets on the market. Okay, finally, I'll show you quickly the last slides. I mean, this is the 12 most common access tablets in Denmark. And more interesting is maybe the second one, which is the Mitsubishi tablets in Denmark. And as you can see, they vary with the, the content of MDMA and even what is in them. I mean, there's one with PMA here, which is also Mitsubishi. And this is another tablet which is actually on the market today in Denmark, which has been reported up to 120 milligrams. So it, it, it's a triangular and not very round as the other tablets. And people do report that they get high release with these tablets, but there might be a simple reason. 
Two ZI is not much to mention apart from it's funny that they're written an I on the top, so it's very evident that you might get two ZI. Uh, Methamphetamine tablets are the Thai pill types. So I will just make a warning about them because they've been seen in Finland, and a very big seizure was done in Switzerland <coughs> just recently. Um, and they are, I mean, as far as I know, they should be more dangerous because the methamphetamine is, is more potent than the MDMA. So I hope we're not going to see them in this country. Okay, finally, the reports about this can be found on the homepage of the National Board of Health, uh, where they, every year would be a comprehensive report, and every quarter of a year we get a smaller report on what we found in the database. Uh, and you can ask yourself, is this representative for the market, what I've shown? And I think as far as it goes, it's, it's fairly representative. A Swiss uh, police officer and also an chemist uh, did a comparison with the even rape database, which is where you can send in tablets and get them analyzed uh, for free uh, with, the, uh, with the seizures done by the Swiss police, and there was a 75% overlap between the two databases. We do not have this in Denmark, but uh, there is one uh, side, this pill report, come where Danish people also tell in, and that's their own description of the pill you just see. You don't see a full analysis. But if you go in this database, you will see an overlap between that and the database we just presented here. So, a conclusion which you can read, and that's about it. Thank you for your attention.